Hi guys, it's Quinn here. The YouTube algorithm is probably sentient by now, for all we know. So to get its attention, click the like button. It really helps out so that my videos actually get seen when I upload them. Thanks guys. In this video we will discuss the original Dune Saga, not including the extra non-Frank Herbert material published in the expanded Dune books. The word Kralizak does not appear in the Dune Saga until the book Children of Dune. It is spoken of as both a terrible fate waiting for humankind in its future, and as a rite of passage for the species, an inevitability that would test humankind to its limits, but in the end leave them with the ability to survive indefinitely within an often malignant universe. Paul Atreides' Jihad killed more than 60 billion humans, but the price of Kralizak would be far greater. He remembered his earliest visions of the Jihad to be, the terror and revulsion he'd experienced. Now, of course, he knew visions of greater terrors. He had lived with the real violence. He had seen his Fremen charged with mystical strength sweep all before them in the religious war. The Jihad gained a new perspective. It was finite, of course, a brief spasm when measured against eternity, but beyond lay horrors to overshadow anything in the past. Paul was the first to foresee the fate of humanity with clarity. He ran from this fate and chose not to act, though the gears had already been set in motion. The duty to lead humankind in Kralizek then fell to his son, Leto. But what exactly is Kralizek? When it is first mentioned in Children of Dune, it is referred to as the Typhoon Struggle. A typhoon is of course a storm, a whirling vortex capable of incredible destruction. Kralizek came from the oldest of Fremen myths, a myth that spoke of a battle at the end of the universe. We get our first glimpse at the meaning behind this word after Leto II sets out on his journey for the taboo place known as Jakarutu, and finds the outcast Fremen, Muris. You speak of leading us, Muris said. Fremen are led by men who've been bloodied. What could you lead us in? Krelazek, Leto said, keeping his attention on the crouched figure. Muris glared at him, brows contracted over his indigo eyes. Krelazek, that wasn't merely war or revolution. That was the Typhoon Struggle. It was a word from the furthermost Fremen legends. The battle at the end of the universe. Krelazek. It seems that for some reason, the Fremen of the Cast Out, who had been banished from Fremen society long ago for the crime of water stealing, preserved the memories of the Krelazek myth better than others. They waited and prepared. Our judges cannot forget Jakarutu. Our day of despair. Kralazak, the typhoon struggle lives in our hearts. The Fremen in the cast out almost seem to think of Kralazak in two ways. Yes, as a reminder of the battle that awaits humankind in the end, but also as a reminder of the struggles of the past and a reminder of all the struggles to come. Kralazak lives within them so they are ever prepared and ever vigilant. Here in Shulok they still pray for dew at the desert's edge. Go, Miris, and pray for Kralizek. I promise you it will come. Kralizek seems almost certainly related to the great enemy that Leto foresaw. His golden path was intended to prepare mankind against this enemy. When Leto refers to Kralizek, he is likely referring to the struggle against this great enemy. Children of Dune mentions that a precise sense of expression is required in order to wield the Fremen language. For the language itself was immersed in the illusion of absolutes. To speak in the Fremen tongue required an exact perception of what was being expressed. It has been suggested in the real world that language does in fact shape thought. It is known as the hypothesis of linguistic relativity, and also sometimes called Worf hypothesis, 
which as a fan of Star Trek The Next Generation and Star Trek Deep Space Nine, I really enjoy that fact. Basically, Worf hypothesis suggests that the structure of a language actually affects the speaker of that language's cognition, even worldview. Most modern linguists don't believe that language can limit and determine cognitive categories, but there has been empirical evidence which suggests that language certainly can influence thought and decision making. Laura M. Adhern outlines much of this research in her publication, Living Language, an Introduction to Linguistic Anthropology. Language is not a neutral medium for communication, but rather a set of socially embedded practices. Every social interaction is mediated by language, whether spoken or written, verbal or nonverbal. We can see how Frank Herbert applied some of these concepts in Dune if we take a look at the Fremen. According to the book Children of Dune, the Fremen language itself, because of the perceived absolutism it required, in part gave birth to the myth of Kralizek. Here is an excerpt taken from the private Bene Gesserit reports illustrating this. Fremen speech implies great concision, a precise sense of expression. It is immersed in the illusion of absolutes. Its assumptions are a fertile ground for absolutist religions. Furthermore, Fremen are fond of moralizing. They confront the terrifying instability of all things with institutionalized statements. They say, we know there is no summa of all attainable knowledge. That is the preserve of God. But whatever men can learn, men can contain. Out of this knife-edged approach to the universe, they carve out fantastic belief in signs and omens and in their own destiny. This is an origin of their Kralizek legend, the war at the end of the universe. Kralizek is absolute in the mind of Fremen because they wield a language which fosters absolutism. Leto II was able to lead humankind through Kralizek because he had freed himself from the illusion of absolutes. Unlike the Fremen and the majority of mankind, Leto no longer clung to a one-eyed vision of the universe. He saw infinite dimensions. This gave him the ability to either greatly help humanity or do terrible damage through terrible decisions as his father had done. Myths about the end times or the end of days are also found in the real world. In fact, almost every religion, Abrahamic or otherwise, has some legend about the climax of human events. Mahayana Buddhist scriptures describe the coming of the Maitreya Buddha who will bring on the end of the world. In Norse mythology, there is of course Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods. It is said that during Ragnarok, the sun will vanish from the sky and the air will become poisonous and the dead would rise once more to walk with the living. Christianity details the second coming of Christ, who would fight a war against the Antichrist, leading to eons of peace before the final end of the world, where all those whose names were not found in the Book of Life would be thrown into the lake of fire. Christianity and the rest of the Abrahamic religions present a linear view of time. There is a beginning, a middle, an end. But many non-Abrahamic religions have a more cyclical view when it comes to the cosmology of the universe. Eschatology pertaining to such religions is characterized by ideas of decay and rebirth. For example, in Hindu mythology, the end time is brought on when Kalki, the tenth and final avatar of the god Vishnu, descends from the cosmos atop a pale white horse to bring an end to the Kali Yuga. In Hinduism, there are four world ages. They are called Yugas. They exist on a cycle. The Kali Yuga is the final and worst of these cycles. Each Yuga cycle is believed to be about 4.3 million years long. So as you can see, the fact that the Fremen have a myth about the end times is not odd at all. After all, just logically speaking, the world as we know it does have to end sometime. Ever since man was conscious enough to contemplate our beginnings, we have also contemplated our ends. Leto took on the responsibility of leading humankind through Krelisek. 
a burden that the Kwisatz Haderach Paul Atreides had run from, unwilling to resign himself to millennia of personal agony. Leto accepted this terrible fate himself, even though he was well aware of how he would suffer through the eons. He runs to tire himself, Ganema said. He is Kralosak embodied. No wind ever ran as fast as he runs. He is a blur atop the dunes. I've seen him. He runs and runs, and when he has exhausted himself at last, he returns and rests his head in my lap. Ask our mother within to find a way for me to die, he pleads. It's important to remember that Kralozak is also referred to as the Typhoon Struggle. This suggests that it will be a time of great testing for humanity, in which the species will be pushed to its limits in a cruel challenge of survival. Preparing humanity to survive the Typhoon Struggle, Kralozak seems to be the entire purpose of Leto's Golden Path. To strengthen humanity against the great enemy by forcing them to endure eons of his tyrannical rule prior to scattering into the reaches of space, diversifying and evolving into greater forms, and also to give humankind the ability to hide from whatever enemy awaited for them in the distant future through the use of the no gene he had bred into the species which could hide those who possessed it from the prescient eye. He'll lead humans through the cult of death, into the free air of exuberant life. He speaks of death because that's necessary still. It is a tension by which the living know they're alive. When his empire falls, oh yes, it'll fall. You think this is Kralizek now, but Kralizek is yet to come, and when it comes, Humans will have renewed their memory of what it's like to be alive. The memory will persist as long as there's a single human living. We'll go through the crucible once more still, and we'll come out of it. We always arise from our own ashes. Always. I think that what Frank Herbert is getting at here ultimately amounts to this. Humans will always imagine their own destruction because we are linear beings. We are born, we live, and we die, both as individuals and as societies. The end of the world seems inevitable because everything else, for us, ends. But at the same time, though humans have existed in cycles of living and dying, the human entity itself endures. The endings we perceive are in actuality temporary struggles that the species as a whole overcomes. But even the human entity is not guaranteed immortality. It is almost certain that there will one day come a true typhoon struggle, an apocalypse, Kralizak, that would truly test humanity, and there will be no returning from this trial if humankind should fail. I invite my viewers to consider the possibility of Kralizek in our real future. I am almost certain that, within this upcoming century, humankind will indeed be tested. And that's a scary thought. We will be forced to endure a typhoon struggle, and perhaps more than one. Ask yourself this, are we as a species ready? Are we prepared for what is to come? Thanks guys for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe for more Quinn's ideas. The sequence has begun. Kralizak commences. Organism, where have you been? I've been looking for you. Inside the void. Um, okay. The cloud darkness of holy judgment approaches. Organism, are you okay? You're acting a little bit strange. I am no longer Organism 9186. Your puny mind could not possibly- Wow, well, according to my device, your radon levels are way out of control. Soon all your kind shall face the crucible. I'll just initiate the, the de-radiating the process the and calibrate and to extinguish. Oh, shall fade into- Wait, where am I? What day is it?
We have to get out of here, you don't understand. We have to get out of here, you don't understand. You're in danger, we all are. Danger? Why are we in danger? Not just us. The universe. The whole universe is ending. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you like and subscribe for more Quinn's ideas. And check out this new merch, Free Organism 8196. Wait, isn't it 9186?